Well, good morning. So this is week five of our six weeks summer course. So I'm going to review what we have. Okay. So uh, we have week one. Uh, it's recorded. I haven't uploaded it to the YouTube, but I will. And the week two is already an, in the YouTube. Okay, this is already in the YouTube. And then we have week three here, also in YouTube. Week four, I'm almost ready to put on the YouTube. I'll review it. So and, uh, last week I was in Miami, International Conference of Unmanned Aircraft Systems Conference. So I uploaded the conference proceedings for you to get a flavor what are those leading uh, players in the field, in the academic field, what they are doing, okay? They're publishing, they're claiming, they're doing something for the first time. So those are research, okay? So today, we are going to have a one invited lecturer uh, talking about drone entrepreneurship ecosystem at UC Merced, okay? And she will be here at around 11.30. So between now and then, we have about two hours talking about uh, command and control and GNC, guidance, navigation, and controls. So uh, that's my hope, okay? That's my hope. So understand what we are going to have today. Basically, C2, command and control, and GNC, guidance, navigation, and control, okay? Good. So the quiz is relatively simple to keep you engaged. So uh, don't worry about that. Um, at some point, I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you what is C3, what is C2, okay? So are you ready? Uh, again, today's lecture is not that deep. Um, so equation-wise, we don't even have any equations. All those are concepts. What's your feeling about our midterm? It's too easy? Too broad? Or too many? I think it was just right. It's about right, right? One hour.
Thank you. So you can see um, the voice is not coming recorded. Oh no, I can see uh, the blue light flash. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, so hopefully we recorded that part. So let's zoom in to see the detailed components inside. So you have uh, A stands for autopilot, so it's roughly here. Battery is uh, roughly. Okay, so working. So actually, the one I really want to show you is this one. It's this one. So this one is more um, technical from what I call multi-loop architecture. Multi-loop architecture. So that you understand that for the, uh, for, for to make the unmanned vehicle move, there are multi-layers of commands is happening. So, um, so at very high level, at a very high level here, you know that where you want to go, you know that where are some places you cannot go. So then, uh, so then you, you based on that knowledge, and based on existing the location map, and you know what kind of waypoints uh, we should go through uh, to uh, get our destination. So, so for, this is at the past planner layer. layer to generate the waypoints, okay? Generate the waypoints that you should visit. But right now, our waypoints are generated by the operators. If you check with Alan or TBL doing the, the sweeping of the fields, okay? So all those are hand man manipulated or designed, okay? Designed, that kind of sweeping path. So then by uh, the waypoints, by the waypoints, but how to execute that, uh, that, that make the drone to fly such that you, ex you visit every waypoint is called pass manager, pass manager. The pass manager will receive these waypoints and understand what, what's the current status of the drone right now. 
where it's heading, you know, what's the speed, what's the angle, course angle. Then to define a path, define a path, okay? That's what today we hope we can have time to cover, okay? To have a path. And so when you define a path already, and then we try to generate the airspeed, attitude, heading commands or references and pass that references signal to autopilots. Then autopilots will generate the servo commands to, to turn each individual servo, okay? So that the manual vehicle will move to achieve the final goal. But during this control process, we, pro we cannot perfectly execute the autopilot. will generate some position arrow, the path tracking arrow, and so on and so forth. So then we use those arrows to, to correct ourselves. Then that correction process is a feedback control process. So that's called flight control system overall here. But the foundation block is what they call state estimator part. This is a semester long course for this alone, okay? okay. So uh, we uh, assume that we have a block there. We will be able to get the state. What are the states? What are the states about our vehicle? So asking that question depends. Uh, you, you also need to refer what is your reference frame. So what, what coordinate system you are talking about, right? So remember this busy slide? So this is flight dynamics. So you have 12 differential equations. Okay, 12 differential equations. Okay. And inside here, the moments and the aircraft uh, aerodynamic forces, if you need to understand, you need some basic aerodynamics. And we do have a dedicated course on aerodynamics, okay? Uh, remember, well, aerodynamics in our course, we mean the aerodynamics of flight, okay? There's something that is not going to fly, like wind turbine, like high-rise building. Okay, so understanding aerodynamics in that setting is also important. Okay, so but we don't have this. So to be able to estimate the x hat, you need to know x means x is a vector of all these components. You need to have sensors to measure all the states. So next few slides, I'm going to go through a little bit detail regarding the sensors, okay, regarding the sensors. So, how, because if you cannot measure, you cannot estimate. So when you say estimate, you need to ask, based on what, then you estimate. Otherwise, it's a direct measurement. However, in many cases, you cannot directly measure many of the variables here. You cannot directly measure. The directly measurable things should be converted into this, okay? So then, to begin with, we need to understand what are those sensors, okay? What are the sensors? The fundamental thing here is accelerometer, red gyros, uh, pressure sensors, and magnetometers, and a GPS. So, so those are the fundamental sensors for uh, uh, small uh, air, uh, I mean aircraft vehicles, okay? So I'm going to go through uh, each of them briefly with you, briefly with you. Okay. So the first of all is the MAM. The first of all is the MAM's accelerometer. So inside, this is very small. In, they can miniaturize this one a lot. Inside here is a mass spring damper system. Very simple one. And of course, this K, this mass, all precisely known, okay? Precisely known. So if somehow we can, so to understand the displacement here, X, we can convert the X into our accelerometer X double dot. So we can always do that, is that right? So if everything else is known, everything else is known. So so we can, we can understand what is the why here, okay. okay? 
is linked to the acceleration here. Okay. So, of course, there are bios. Okay, there are uh, noise. So the sensor model is. This is the actual acceleration you measured. This A is the true acceleration. Okay? So ideally this is one, but if this is not one but it's none, it's fine, right? But if this is also none, then if we know this this value, we can also know the A. And so if we know all these, okay. So we can convert that. But the question is the noise. Sometimes you do not know, okay? Sometimes you know. So, you, so the process of understanding the coefficients here and here and the noise characteristics is precisely called the calibration process. You need to calibrate it. But fortunately, those things are already done and the inside the MEMS, what is MEMS? Microelectromechanic system macroelectromechanic system. So inside here, this is a MAM system like this. So, okay. So each of this one is a very small uh, mass spring damper system. Okay. okay. And there are also signal processing units inside. So, so that's the key concept. Uh, so major acceleration is the total acceleration of the accelerometer casing minus the acceleration of the gravity. So you need to know the gravity as well. So then, um, so if you put the accelerometer on the tabletop, well, what it measures? So acceleration measures component of linear, Coriolis, and externally applied acceleration. So they do not measure gravity, since both of the proof mass so the inside here is called proof mass, and then the casing acting on, on by the gravity in exactly the same way. So the gravity cannot be measured by that way. Okay. So uh, so another way, accelerometer measures specific force. Okay, which is defined as the sum of the non-gravitational force divided by the mass. So non-gravitational, you need to minus the gravity, okay? So here is uh, the free body uh, diagram. Um, so for our fixed wing aircraft, so you have gravity here, dragging here, and thrust this direction, lift this direction, angle of this, uh, angle of attack, theta. We project as a 2D. So what's if you put accelerometer in here, what is measuring? Okay, what is measuring? So the, all the acceleration will be all the vector. These are the vector sum, okay? Vector summation. So you have three axes, right? Okay, three axes. So then you have this rigid body uh, dynamics, okay? Rigid body dynamics. So this is uh, f F total minus gravity, all these are the vector, the broad phase is vector. So this is A measured, okay? So the A measured, uh, we need to project all this measured on the body frame, okay? Body frame, okay? So this AX, AY, AZ is referred as body frame, in you know, a body frame. Um, so, In other words, we can see this uh, acceleration components in X, Y, Z direction. If we compare to the flight dynamics in the previous slides, we'll be able to write in this way, okay? You write this way. And these are the noises, okay? These are the noises, okay? Noise. Acceleration. So, so this is called accelerometer model. When we say model, meaning there is a way to convert what the measured acceleration, okay, and come and linked to the in, internal unknown forces, unknown forces. So you can see that if you measure why uh, those acceleration here, okay, if you want to understand what is fx, no, no way. You also need to know the theta, okay, the angle. 
So it's connected. All right. So next, we are going to talk about MEMS rate gyro. Okay. Gyro. Uh, of course, uh, using a point translating on a rotational rigid body, uh, rigid body in the Coriolis acceleration. I'm not sure you covered this one in your statics dynamics. You haven't. But let's assume that you know this is a cross product of two vectors. Okay. Uh, this is a, no, sorry. Omega is a matrix and V is a vector. Um, so the proof mass, this small proof mass, uh, put into uh, here, uh, it's called a resonating proof mass. Okay. And this one, when it vibrates, it reflects about your rotation. Okay, rotation. So if you visually see, this uh, angular rate can be uh, measured uh, by this uh, rate gyro, okay, rate gyro. And also rate gyro model um, can be directly get from, uh, so from manufacturers, they will give you this uh, rate gyro have a drift term, so uh, drift, and as zero mean Gaussian noise, this is a Gaussian noise, uh, this is a drifting term. This is a constant, okay? The omega is your, um, uh, is an angular uh, speed, radians per second in the body, okay? Remember, it's in the body frame, okay? Reference frame, okay? Reference frame. So this is a proportion, this is a constant. So in other words, PKR, PQR can be somewhat measured directly by this sensor, PQR. That is the rotation rate in the body axis. So like a rolling rate, pitching rate, yawing rate, and so on, PQR, okay? And these can be measured. But the BIOS term and noise term should be handled carefully, okay? Uh, I would think we, we, we talk about pressure sensor, We're talking about pitot tube, and so about difference, about dynamic pressure, aerodynamics, so we can uh, infer what is the speed, okay? Pressure measurements, okay, pressure measurements. And uh, pressure measurements, so you can use this one to measure. So, uh, and pressure is linked to the altitude. Okay, in linked altitude. So that is uh, the hydrostatics, the very basic equation uh, in the ground level. So this ground level pressure versus pressure in here. So you have uh, the above, above ground level, AGL, the height. This is a gravity constant. This rho is uh, at air density. Uh, so in, in uh, like uh, 11,000 meters below, uh, there's a, a very interesting uh, equation already calibrated, okay, like this equation. So, so it is quite linear. So you can see here, if you fly like uh, less than 500 meters, okay, so it is very linear about the attitude versus the pressure, okay, versus the pressure. So remember, this is very very accurate. Okay, go ahead. One thing that was, uh, uh, at least from what I've seen with the drones, is that when the wind blows, it can butt with the measurement on the pressure sensor. That's true. So everything is coupled. In fact, they're very complicated to do the x hat estimation. So x hat. So let me do this. So what I'm saying is, so how we can we know flight dynamics? Flight dynamics. So we need to know something aerodynamics so that those coefficients make sense. So we try to get x hat, the state estimate, so that we can do the multi-loop type of uh, path planning. But what are those information here? This is what we are now discussing about um, accelera accelerometer, uh, we have gyro, now we have uh, 
pressure and many others, okay? Many others. And uh, like a magnetometer and GPS, of course. I'm saying here, I should say that uh, not accuracy, but uh, um, linearity, linearity. It's quite linear, okay? But when the height is very high, the difference is very big, okay? You should correct that. So that's attitude measurements. And so for how to do the speed measurements, the pitot tube, I think we mentioned this uh, uh, again. So it is uh, uh, it's a square. This is a dynamic, pr this is a, sorry, uh, this is a, a, a dynamic pressure, dynamic pressure. This is difference uh, of the of the pressure, you know, the pitot static pressure sensor measures the dynamic pressure, okay, dynamic pressure. <coughs> I think we, we, we have this one before, we have this one before. So, so far we talked about accelerometer, we talked about pressure measurements, gy uh, gyro and pressure measurements, airspeed measurement. Now next is, what is a magnetometer and digital compass? So basically when you are flying, so you have a local magnetic field. So I'm hoping that uh, I have a magnetic north. So then, uh, then we will be able to understand what is your angle, heading. So where is your heading angle? Uh, heading angle. Heading is the sum of the magnetic declination angle and magnetic heading, okay? magnetic heading. So you have absolute north. And th these are the angles are none, okay? These are, delta is none. But uh, this heading, we don't know yet. So this phi of m is a uh, magnetic heading, okay? Magnetic heading. You add the delta will be the overall phi, of, okay? Uh, phi. So, so we basically can solve those transformation, okay? Transformation. But remember, magnetic de declination variation is, is a global phenomenon like this. Okay, so depending on the different places, you need to be careful. Sometimes you get something wrong and that because of this, maybe, okay? All right, so just be careful. And uh, in the Wikipedia, uh, they, they, they have more detailed explanation about this magnetic inclination, okay? And GPS, everybody knows pretty well, and take it for granted, okay? Take it for granted, the iPhone will have this, so. Um, so I, I'm not going to go through this one a lot. Um, but good thing to know is, what are the arrows in the GPS? Okay, what are the arrows in the GPS? Okay. So uh, there are numerous sources for the arrows in the time of flight measurements. So these are the uh, many uh, technical details regarding this GPS arrow. But categorize, uh, characterization is like this. So it's called a user equivalent range arrow. UERE is basically perceived from the user and user point of view. What is the arrow? So um, there are only two things in that UERE user equivalent range arrow, BIOS and random, BIOS and random. So you can see the BIOS is more dominant um, in the different, different source of the data in here, but let's do this UERE. So this is a 5.1 meter, uh, in meters, okay? And this is one sigma value, one sigma value. What is one sigma value? So you have a Gaussian distribution, do you? you? Have Gaussian distribution. So this is three sigma, three sigma. In three, so everything in between here is like 99.97. But in here, one sigma, one sigma. That means one sigma is, is how, how many percent? No, we, we can check, we can check now, don't worry. I don't remember either. Uh, it's not 97, probably 70% or something, I remember. Let me check. So, Gaussian, one 
sick of my so actually it's one sigma is 60 I said 70 percent so you have 68, 95, 99, so 99.7. So three sigma is 99.73, two sigma is 95.5, one sigma is only 60 here, okay? It's only 68, almost 70%, okay? So good to know. So let me go back to this one. So because it's so random, right? So talking about absolute value is meaningless. You have to talk about sigma, okay, and mean, okay? So sigma is 5.1, 5.1 meters, okay? And the random randomness is 1.4. So in total is 5.3 meters. So then after you do some filtering, then this is smaller, but this bar is still there. So totally is like five meters. That's why we should understand that the GPS arrow is around five meters. Okay, it's around five meters. Okay, but people trying to model those arrow and characteristics and trying to improve it, and uh, so basically they try to try to improve it. And uh, so, you some some modeling, uh, some modeling process of the GPS signal, and it turns out that it can filter this arrow, and it looks like quite close, or quite close. So, those are the sensors in the, those are the sensors in the GPS. Okay, and when we talk about GPS arrow. GPS arrow. We also need to project the arrow in the different frames, okay, different frames. There are more technicalities regarding the arrows. Uh, so here, there's something, uh, the total GPS arrow, like root mean square level, standard deviation of the root mean square uh, arrow in the northeast plane, northeast plane, is 6.6 .6 meters, okay, 6.6 .6 meters. Uh, in the attitude is about 9.2. So all these num all these numbers can be computed from this uh, UERE and HDOP and stuff like that. Okay. If you want to understand more technical details, you can refer to uh, the book by uh, Randy Beer and um, uh, Tim McLean um, for the Princeton University Press. And but let me summarize. In GPS, you should never expect its accuracy is better than 5.1 if you are in two-dimensional north, uh, in the north and the east, northeast plane, north and the east plane. Those arrows is around 6.6, 6.6 meters, in the root, root mean square sense, root mean square sense. But you heard about in the vertical, the height, the accuracy of that height is about 10 meters accuracy. So it cannot be better than 9.2 meters. So when I have GPS reading, say I'm now about 20 meters height, don't trust that. It's a plus or minus 9.2. It's never accurate. Understand? If you saw GPS coordinate is here, we read the usual plus or minus six. That range, plus or minus six, 6.6. 6. And the height is plus or minus 9.2, okay? All these can be computed through some equations like this, altitude error. So at this point, I think we overview um, this or sensors get raw data, then how to convert the data into our uh, x hat. So went through the 
the sensors here. So let me add a few more here. Pressure and uh, Peter tube. Okay, Peter tube. And we have GPS. We have some digital campus, compass, or um, magnetometer. Okay, magnetometer. So in my time, 10 years ago, having these, all these sensors together is so luxurious. But today, we are very easy to get um, the sensors to have nine degrees of freedom. What does that mean? Meaning we have three acceleration. So this is three, A, X, A, Y, A, Z. And I have PKR. And I have magnetometer times three channels of uh, the angle, okay? So this three plus three plus three, and then you have GPS, uh, you have pitot tube. So then you put all information together, how to fuse them, it's called sensor fusion. And usually you need to use dynamic filtering like common filtering. That's a semester long course. Um, or some other simplified filtering approach like complement, com uh, uh, complementary um, filters and so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, we are in 10, 20. Our time is perfect to finish this deck of slides. Um, any questions at this point? So, we didn't go into the fusion part. We, we don't have time to do that part. Yes, you can do now. Oh, you can do now? Mm-hmm. This one? Oh, you want to use that to describe the equations. You want to use that to describe the blocks. No. No? No. In fact, uh, in fact uh, I, I did some homework uh, for you, but um, I, can, I can share this one with everyone. Um, I know where is the exact part if you're uncomfortable here. Because the, the model could be I have, so you are talking about OS4 related questions? Yeah, OS4 related questions. Yes, okay. So what is the specific question? Uh, exactly what it says. It's like, I don't understand how we're going to use the differential equations to describe the, the model. Because it's not clear to me exactly how we're going to use the differential equations to describe the, the model. You don't understand the model? Yeah. So the model, you don't have to. So you only need a rough idea about what's behind it. It is something like this. It's a set of differential equations. Okay. And it's grouped by different groups. Yeah. OK. But do you want to describe each part of that model, like in those slides, mm -hmm. using those equations on the board? Yes, I hope you can do some reverse engineering so that you click until you cannot click further. Because you click, there you, there's a, some blocks, com, uh, so uh, submasked blocks. So then, so they give you a higher level. So oh, this is uh, input, this is output. But what's inside of here? So you double click, you will see more. And I hope you will be able to fill in the details of this block. Okay. So say for example, I have a block like this. Yeah, I think this is a good question. I like your question. The the reason is. Uh, we can do something like this. Yes. I think your question is like this. Is whether this is what I expected. So you have seen a block. So you put some signal 
in here, signal in here, you have signal out, right? So basically, so oh, you have a U1 and a U2, you have Y, you say Y equals F U1, U2, they say, oh, this is something called this, okay? So I want you to double click this, they will unpack for you. They will tell you what's inside. So you, you need to give me specifics. What is this F? Writing expressions. So you should be able to uh, do, the, I call this as a reverse engineering. Because instead of saying, oh, this is a F, then you can specify what exactly is this F. Okay, so then you want to use those Yeah, I have something here. Some, give me a second. I, I have something here. Uh, last semester we did uh, uh, OS4. Simulink. Say again? Only for the sistema or for the sistema and the noise filter? Everything. <coughs> Everything? Yes. Okay. So basically you will be, you will be able to uh, see uh, the full, uh, sorry, uh, the full models they, they describe in here, all these equations, you can find out in the simulink. Okay. Yeah, so you, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence. So I have uh, already done this reverse engineering myself. So I put into a PowerPoint, and uh, it should be somewhere. Oh, it's in the lab. I remember now. It's in the lab. Huh? Oh, maybe homework. Okay, doesn't matter. Uh, I, I'll find out that file for you, so you can uh, take a look. Um, I call it reverse, reverse engineer, engineering work on our... Uh... Oh, it's here. Okay, sorry. So, um, Is that posted online? Or? I think it's shared already uh, in some parts already in the... So basically, I want you uh, to, to, to write down what's the relationship between the code and the formula. Uh, basically, so, so the dynamics part, you will see the signals from where to where. And uh, so rolling moment code formula. So you have code on this side, formula on this side. And this formula is fun. Is this, you, I uploaded that chapter. So these are from that chapter. So, so you have equations are here, and codes are here. From that, you have M, you have confidence that oh, so I don't want you write from beginning. I want you to be able to appreciate. Just like you don't have to be a football player to be able to appreciate football game. <laughs> See what I mean? So, <clears throat> so in the future, if you are required to dive into that detail, you have confidence to go back here and focus on this. Okay. That's my purpose. So I go through another one for you? Uh, yeah, sure. I go another one for you? So in here, you will see the your moments, they do something here. Oh, okay. I, so that's acceptable to just like kind of snap like that? Yeah, I, I hope you went through the code and roughly see. So these are the uh, X, Y, Z, all total forces, they add together. So then you have a much better understanding about the flat dynamics. So all those 12 differential equations. So these are the code and the formula comparison. And so then uh, how you can do propeller speed set point and its true speed. So they have a rotor dynamics, put something like this, and so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah, I think I understand what you're asking for.
Okay, so I'm going to upload this file and for everybody. So you don't have to repeat to do. So use this one as your starting point. Okay? So mm hmm. Okay. So, any other questions you want to discuss? I'll just give you an idea about what I have here. So I told you that uh, we have uh, yeah, we went through about 39 slides until all the end of the, all the sensors talking about oh, OK, it's another side talking about the sensors. OK? Next, I'm, I will have avionics system modules I can, I can go through with you. The RC receiver, telemetry, and paparazzi autopilots, uh, the main flight controller, plus the coprocessor here, a gum stick, and GPS IMU, eddy one servos, and propeller motors, and so, so on and so forth. So that we have all the details, GPS, modem, okay, an RC receiver, RC receiver, and uh, more RC receiver, um, IMU. So this micro strand, uh, GX2, at, at my time a few years back, is considered as the best. Uh, Fifteen hundred dollars. Go ahead. I don't suppose it's possible to ask for one more day to work on the assignment or no? Oh yes, go ahead. Oh, one more day, that's fine. Uh huh. Okay, cool. For full credit or no? Um. I think we can change the uh, deadline and to accommodate everybody's. So if many of you asked, I can accommodate. Uh, okay. The extension for one day? One day. What is the deadline I forgot I said? Tonight? 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 Yeah. How about uh, Wednesday night? Yeah, yeah. 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 Because you have uh, more, more exposure, more exposure to knowledge, you can do better. Thank you. Okay, good. So uh, now everybody knows what is IMU? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm not going to explain that. But I, do you know this price is 1500 It was? Five years back? Yeah, it's 1500 Even today, it's still very expensive. And uh, IMU has a different grades. So let me show you one thing here. Uh, so in 2010, we published a paper to do a evaluation of the low cost IMU used for unmanned uh, air systems. Uh, I met Haiyang and I met Calvin Kuhnman uh, this time in Miami. It's a very good un uh, re reunion. So I, I'm not going to go through the details and you can read the state of art review by 2010, okay, 2010. And then remember, what is the conference name? International Conference on Multi-Sensor Fusion and Integration for Intelligent Systems. Is a drone intelligent system? Of course, otherwise it will crash, right? So, but to be able to be in this, uh, intelligent, what is needed? You need to fuse all the information well. When you drive, do you need to do information fusion? Of course you need. Right? You need to hear your GPS uh, navigator's prompts and watch uh, hands on your wheel and uh, eyes on, your, on the road. And here uh, you can you know, hear other. So all the information will come and fuse and you know, make sure you are driving intelligently. So that's interesting. And also, we also did autopilot review, and uh, that's by year also 2010. Uh, 2010. Again, Haiyang, we work together on this. So that's uh, for the first part, uh, command and control. Command and control. So let me summarize the message. To be able to do a uh, command and control, you need a dedicated command and control communication channel. So previously we, we used this uh, 
um, dedicated channel, okay, dedicated channel, and 900 hertz data channel. But today, many of those are in a 2.4 gigahertz, okay, channel. And for the communication basics and long distance uh, drone communication antenna and so on and so forth, it's already covered in last week, Wednesday's lecture by Derek Hollenbeck. So I'll put those in the slide, uh, in, the, in the YouTube, okay? So, because we have three invited lectures, okay, invited lectures this week, so that means uh, I need to speed up so that we make room for those invited speakers. They give you different perspectives, okay? So what's next? I'm going to go through uh, our main error systems um, guidance, uh, navigation, and control. Okay, so it's called GNC. GNC. It's usually uh, it's usually spelled that way, GNC. But I did a bracket NCG, navigation, control, and guidance. So control and guidance. So uh, my question is, why we say that? Why I say that? Okay, so uh, let's start. So we actually, this is uh, the lecture for the Wednesday. So, but I would like to cover now. So let's make a um, break at 11.20, okay? All right, so let's go on faster. So this one, I mainly followed a dedicated chapter by the principles of guidance, navigation, and control, GNC, uh, and many other systems. Uh, Professor Elkham from uh, UC Santa Cruz, and we used to work together on some proposals. And these are his uh, collaborators and uh, students. So, in fact, we are going to cover in such a uh, sequence we navigate, then control, then make guidance. This gives you a rough idea about what we did this kind of multi-layered uh, architecture for the, re remember we have a mission, then we have waypoints, then we have hidden commands, then we have servo command, okay? All right, so I hope you remember that picture. Let me, let me take out that picture for you again. So there, this is, okay, you don't say this, but it's okay. Okay, so let me, let me remind you this one. Uh, Again, okay. So, this is architecture of the layered path planner, path manager, path following, and autopilot. So, autopilot is basically giving the detailed command to each servos, and make sure it is with small position arrows. So, this is called servo. Okay, servo. Okay. So, but from guidance navigation point of view, we are talking here is. Uh, basically talking about the background, attitude, and the position estimation. So it will give you a rough idea that X, how the X hat is, X hat is uh, uh, obtained. Then either loop control, and the last one is the guidance. Last one is the guidance. So in, in other words, we should understand in such a way that, so you have a, uh, transmitter, receiver, and ground data link. So this is GCS ground components. This is aer airborne components. So this is in the ground. This is in the air. Okay, in the air. So when you receive or send information or receive information, so you have airborne data link, transmitter, receiver. Then pass that information to guidance module. Okay, and the guidance module receiving the navigation module's output. 
and give to the control module. The control module will also give its uh, 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 change in the navigation sensor uh, readings. Okay? Because if you control, then it will change. Navigation sensor reading will be different. Then, then you put it in the navigation module, and also those information can come back. Okay, come back. So that's from a, a different point of view. So we need to understand, so this is the aircraft in here. So we need to understand from GNC point of view. So guidance, navigation, and control. Okay? Uh, but I said it should be like NCG, okay? This is inner, this is a intermediate, and this. So this is what? So this is, a, uh, this is a control, okay? This is a control. This is navigate, okay? This is guidance. Don't you see that? So, so GNC should be NCG. So the first is navigate, okay? So that you res you do uh, uh, inertial. Yings is a inertial system, inertial navigation system, INS, inertial navigation system, inertial navigation system. Inertial navigation system, INS, INS. So those and GPS integration. So INS means those accelerometers, gyros, digital compass, or uh, digital uh, uh, magnetometers, uh, pitot tubes, pressure sensors, and GPS integration. So then with this navigation sensor information, you do filtering and combine with your flight dynamics so that you know where you are. Then depending on the command I receive from guidance path planning level, I know what this loop references should be. So this is called control, control. And usually it's using a PID control, okay? And guidance, okay, guidance. So let me go back a slide, give you a rough idea here. So here is C, okay, here is C. And here is G, oh sorry, here is N, okay? Okay, then here is G, guidance. Okay, so when we start to discuss details, we should understand um, what is the reference frame. So something is called inertial reference frame. It's right-handed orthogonal system. Origin A is the center of the Earth. The ZI axis point to the north. Uh, XI axis point towards the of vernal equinox, okay, and the yi axis perpendicular to both axis. So that's kind of a right hand rule, right hand rule, right hand rule, do this, okay, right hand rule, okay, right hand rule. So that's called inertial reference, meaning you are carried by the earth, you are on the earth, so it's kind of like earth's coordinate system, okay. Uh, so this is called inertial reference, sorry, I, I correct. So Earth's fixed reference frame origin is any arbitrary location on the ground, like your launch point, ZE points towards the ground, okay, towards the ground. Perpe uh, it is perpen uh, perpendicular to it. XE is directed north. YE can be obtained by the right hand side, right hand rule, okay. And body reference frame is easy. So there are many others like stability reference frame, aerodynamics or air pass reference frame, uh, vehicle reference frame, frame. So what is actually the uh, inertial navigation system and uh, GPS integration? So inertial measurement units usually using the AD company's inertial system is a six degree of freedom uh, temperature calibrated inertial measurements units with three axis accelerometer 
Okay, so it's 90 degree of freedom here. Three axis accelerometer, three axis of gyros, and three axis of magnetometer. Okay, so then GPS, then pitot tube. So usually using this uh, uh, measuring angle of attack and the side slip angle. Okay, let me review uh, these with you. So this is. Uh, so the plan of symmetry in the middle, and you have also a body frame, and this is body frame, YB's body, okay? So uh, stability axis, so this is the body axis, okay? And the stability axis, the velocity vector is here, okay? Velocity vector is here. So velocity vector projection to XS, and then here is another angle. This is a vertical angle. That is called angle of attack. This is called side slip. Side slip. So this is another view about the angle. So the x-axis. So this is x-axis. The xw is relative to the wind. Okay. 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 And this is x. The stability here. So this is alpha, this is beta. Alpha is angle of attack, beta is side slip, okay, side slip. So what is considered as the complete state of the UAV X hat? So here you have the 12 ones. So position, X, Y, Z, velocity, another three, attitude, Another three, airspeed, angle of attack, side slip, and rotation pitch roll, roll uh, the, angle, the rates. So 12 of them, 12 of them, okay? But on the other hand, so sometimes you may say, oh, um, you have velocity, you have also here, you have velocity, what's, what's going on here, airspeed? Be careful. We 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 need to know the the, the wind. We need to the wind. Okay. We need to know the wind. So all these navigation states only includes position, velocity, and attitude. Okay. Those are position. Those position. So. So why we don't have a, a your PTR? Uh, rates, we don't need the rates. So we don't have to specify the aircraft must rotate at the giving the speed. No, 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 it's not needed. But you need to navigate the system to go to the designated velocity, okay? So that's why. So navigated state means you have to approach to the giving position, giving, with giving velocity, giving attitude, kind of angle eventually. So that's called navigated, uh, navigation state. So the state to be navigated. So here, I'm going to draw a diagram for you. So is, so be careful, okay, about, about different lines. So the green lines are directed from the sensors, okay, sensors. Uh, the, the blue, sorry, blue. The black, black lines called Ying's sensor. What is Ying's sensor? I told you the Ying sensor is this nine degree freedom here. So this is called Ying's sensor, okay? That, that sensor is very um, small and also very expensive, okay? A few hundred dollars. So, so this is from Ying's sensors. Mainly you have nine, nine signals. Three acceleration, three um, we all pitch your rates, gyro rates, and three magnetometer, so nine. And this is the arrow reset signal. So those are some arrows in there, and you use that arrow to make the arrow small. Then it will be nice. So something in this magic box is called an extended common filter. I don't believe at your stage you should understand what's inside in here. It's, it's uh, way too much for you. But good news is, you take it as 
uh, there are many open source uh, modules there. You can just leverage. But you should understand at this system level what's, what's in and what's out. Okay? What's in and what's out. So what is out is basically all the error signal. To get this error signals, meaning, oh, you are, you are, you are not accurate. So, but compared to what? Okay, compared to what? So these are the GPS, uh, GPS position and velocity for the navigation states, navigation states. Okay, navigation states. For these are the, the, the sensor information. So then uh, use this uh, BIOS compensation, uh, then having this accelerator IMU, uh, acceleration and gyro, uh, three components, three components. These are the direct raw measurements. And uh, with this sensor, and then uh, you compare, then you have uh, this A signal. And integrate that one, you will get velocity. <laughs> integrate one more time, you get position. So, all right. So integrate, 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 okay? So these are the position, this is uh, velocity, this is acceleration. Uh, of course, you need the gravity compensation as well, okay? Um, so that is what they called INS GPS integration. When I was a student, this slide will cost us like at least half a year or one year to implement and to understand and to fine tune. But today, this can be considered as a box that you don't have to, okay? Uh, it's all um, in a box for you. You can take it for granted, okay? So that's overall, uh, we assume that we can, and we can do this kind of integration and have Pretty nice <coughs> estimation navigation state. Okay. Then after that, what we do? What we do? So these are the foundation information based on the raw sensors. Then what we do? So this is basically navigation part. Okay. Navigation sensors. How we use them. After that, what we do? It's basically you need to use uh, all those uh, ground control station operator input is here, okay? Okay, is it here? So you can use, this is like manual mode. And uh, this black one is do a navigation. So navigation configuration here, waypoints, what waypoints you visit. So navigation will generate reference to this. Uh, if you turn this one into automatic navigation, so instead of doing uh, operator inputs, so you turn this one is a switch to here, switch to here. Then you produce, you produce the reference, okay? The heading, longitudinal channel, okay? And lateral channel, how fast you move, okay? Lateral channel. So this is called inner loop. So inner loop control to generate, generate all those servo signals, the delta R, delta A, delta E, delta T. So these are the servo reference signals. You should turn your aileron this, this much angle, you know. If you turn too much, you will come back and correct this one again, okay? So this is called inner loop control. So remember, we have lateral channel and longitudinal channel, okay? Longitudinal channel. So uh, like, uh, what's the heading angle and what's the rate of the yawing, uh, okay? So, uh, so of course here, these are the inner loop. You can set up uh, the controller gains by operators in the ground control station. So that you can tune the performance. So, um, but usually you don't. Usually you don't have to. OK. 
Okay, so I'm going to explain to you the inner loop control in here. So let me go back to our familiar slide on what we are doing here. It's here. So these are the commands to the vehicle. But what is the reference? So basically the delta, the heading, okay? That is the heading to the autopilot. So we are we're actually doing here. So in here we have all the pilots. So we give them all this, uh, the set point for this uh, servos, set point for those servos. So this is the servo command, okay? You turn nine degrees this, but then all the pilot will, will move the servo nine, nine, nine degrees, but if it's not, it keep turning until you reach there. So that's called inner loop. So the inner loop is for lateral control channel controls rudder and aileron, and the longitudinal control handles throttle and elevation, okay? Ele sorry, elevator. So we assume that we don't have very high degrees of lateral longitudinal cross coupling uh, for aircraft performing aggressive aerobatic maneuver. So we do just a regular. So the inner loop is for stabilization. So this is the inner loop for stabilization to make sure the uh, aircraft reacts. And the outer loop is for guidance. For the inner loop control, so I'm going to give, so you give the, what's you, what's you, so we zoom in this one, okay, or this one, we're going to see something like this. So for lateral acceleration, you do feedback, negative feedback control. So you do PID controller, and then you produce the rudder command. It's delta R, okay? Uh, delta R, okay? Delta R rudder. So then uh, you have aileron command. Uh, so this is lateral inner loop. So you have a turning rate then you compute the role that should generate the commanded role. Then in the role measured, you have difference. Then you do PID control. Then you generate aileron command. So that's the inner loop. Go back a slide. So the aileron command is in here. The rudder command is here. All of them, so should be, all of them should be what? Should be closed loop controlled closed loop control like this. So these are the feedback, okay? These are the feedback. So you say, oh, we don't have feedback, what's going on? And this is because there should be a reference as zero, okay? Okay? Because this is like saying this way. So lateral acceleration, we should not to put acceleration, we should put zero in here. So this is my lateral acceleration. Then you have the PID. So then this is a rudder command, third R, okay, third R. So because this is zero, so I can directly write this signal as a negative sign here. Do you see a negative sign? So that's why, okay? It's basically zero minus is basically zero minus this guy. So zero minus this guy is minus this guy, okay? So that's for lateral inner loop. So we don't have to explain this one for you. Lateral control, use the rudder aileron, keep the aircraft fly in the coordinated turn following a commanded turn rate, including a zero turn rate for straight line if you do straight straight flight, then uh, the turning rate should be zero. So that's why turning rate is zero. Lateral dynamics of aircraft includes the roll rate damping mode, spiral mode, Dutch roll, and your roll coupling mode, and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to, uh, I would think we, we explain a little bit on this uh, flight dynamics part. I'm not going to cover it further. Okay, so there are technical details. So, commanded roll angle, 
phi c is uh, rho angle, okay, rho angle. Uh, um is the measured airspeed, g is gravity. So then uh, we can compute, we can compute what is uh, the phi dot and uh, uh, psi dot, okay, okay, psi dot. So we assume that the pitch angle and your pitch angle and your rate are both small in this case. Okay. So in that chapter, it's more on. So this side is like half page explanation about all this. Um, so longitudinal control we have similar. Thing in here first is throttle command how fast I need to move okay throttle is linked to the speed right so then you should have a, a commanded air speed meaning how fast you want I command it so from G, this is from GCS then but is this is air speed what I measured how I can measure air speed listen is because I computed the air speed through what through dynamic pressure uh, if you want to do dynamic pressure, then you need the equation, you need a rho, the air density. To, need, to compute air density, you need to know how high you are at. So then you need a pressure sensor to detect your attitude. So then, with the air speed, actual air speed and commanding air speed, there's a reference, there's a there's difference the difference will drive through the com PID controller to the throttle command, okay? Throttle, fast or high, so. Then elevator meaning is the, uh, uh, the attitude command, okay, pitch. How, how much I should pitch, okay? So pitch, so the elevator command is generated by the desired pitch command, okay? And the pitch measured. How you can measure pitch? You need state estimation, all right? So from those INS and GPS fusion. So you, you get this state estimate. But the command is from where? From attitude command. Meaning, I want you to fly at this height. If you are not at this height, you should pitch up a little bit, then reach the height. If you not, if you above the height, you should pitch down. And you know, it's depending on the attitude command uh, about your uh, actual attitude. So then we know that I should pitch up or down, giving a command. And then compared to the real pitch then I need to make it a control, so that I, I turn my elevator, the elevator, okay, up and down, okay, up and down. Make sense? Okay, so all these things you can see actually in the code of OS4, okay? So I hope you can understand from GNC point of view, okay, GNC point of view. So however, there is a coupling from the roll because you do the pitch, if you are not on the straight flight, you do the pitch is not on a few pitch, uh, pure pitch, you, you should, when you are a little bit turning, so you should also yaw, also, also roll, okay? So that's why you have a roll, okay? So then a roll measured, do this equation, and then this is again K, add to this one, okay? And the explanation of this feed forward is in the text. I uploaded that chapter for you in the UAV handbook. So because it's called a climb and descent versus a level flight, it's different. In a level flight mode, okay, airspeed is controlled directly by the throttle and attitude using the pitch uh, via the elevator, okay? But however, when you are climbing and descent, the throttle is set to a fixed value. You don't, don't change that. High for climb, low for descent, airspeed and climb rate are controlled through their pitch via the elevator as well. So they can do this 
level flight, keep it, and climbing and descending. Okay, descending. So we, we talked about the air density is linked to the uh, attitude, okay? The Q dynamic pressure rose the atmospheric density. So this is a major, this is a uh, uh, UM is uh, the actual uh, air speed. So let me go quickly. So we have talked about two parts. The first part is navigation. Second part is the control. Okay, how to do a longitudinal, how to do a um, lateral. So using this decoupled point of view. Okay, if you work with the six degree full nonlinear model, you are, you will be in trouble, right? So, so next is guidance. Okay, next is guidance. So uh, to guide the UAV along the desired trajectory, rejecting disturbances as wind. So it's a navigation and control, then you guide, you guide. Being able, so this is a more higher level, okay? More higher level. So GNC ultimately signifies the ability to follow a desired trajectory through the sky uh, with attitude estimation established in the loop stabilizing aircraft what is left is to guide the UAV to the desired trajectory without being drifted. So the guidance module is in here, okay, it's in here. I, I explained many times, but um, I'm going to show you here, it's more interesting. So we have navigate, navigation, you have control, and you have guidance, okay. So it's another look of this thing. And there are many strategies of guiding, how you guide the aircraft to go through the desired path. Let me go through an uh, example for you. Um, so, so this dashed line is a path. Uh, listen carefully. You, you have to know this one, okay? If you don't know this one, then you cannot really claim that you know the, the drone stuff, you know. So I want you to go from here to here, but along which path? There are infinitely many paths, but you choose some path like this, then uh, actually track the desired trajectory. So you, the lateral acceleration command must be converted to an appropriate bank angle command using the steady state turn equation so, uh, so uh, the derivation of this one is, so this is your actual, command, actual banking angle eta. So you, you basically, you are flying towards this line here, okay? But you want to go from here to hit this point, you will go this way, okay? Suppose you are doing an arc. So then it turns out that it's like arc by arc type of adjustment, okay? So you move to the next point, you are here, suppose you are here, then you do another arc, you try to follow here. So it's always doing this kind of arc, always. So then you can, you can just say that air one is this vector, uh, divided by two is here, this is this one, I have sine phi, uh, sine eta times the radius, turning radius, you have a relationship like this, okay? So in this way, you know that you have uh, acceleration along this path, you have acceleration, then uh, you have this one. So then, why, what, this is a uh, desired. If you go this way, you have desired acceleration like this, but you should add the acceleration angle, uh, sorry, desired command acceleration should be like this one. You replace the uh, R, uh, you replace one of R into here, so you have this equation, okay? So you don't have to specify what is your uh, turning radius, okay?
turning radius. And the turning radius R can be specified later as a constraint. As, as constraint. Uh, so, so you have a A command, acceleration command, it should be like this. The VG is your uh, ground speed, okay, ground speed at this point. So next, what are you going to do is to fly based on this acceleration command. By that, um, you are able to give uh, this appropriate bank angle. Bank angle is obviously from here is command divided by G. Divided by G. G. So that's a generic method okay, to do the pass following. The idea is you fly by an arc. So suppose you want to fly to this point on this path. So you generate this path. You know at this point I want to do here, so you just go here. And then next time you say I should be here, so you just put this one as a reference. So you just generate that. So the specific case for this general case here like this, specifically you can do something like this, how you can maintain a straight line path tracking. So I want you to do P1 and P0 to P1, but your aircraft is in here, okay? So how you can make sure that you fly eventually onto the pass and follow straight? How you can maneuver? So that's guidance. You guide your aircraft to this straight line path you desire. You want this aircraft to fly along this straight line, OK? But you are not. So how you guide it to is guidance. So this is called a guidance law you derive, OK? So basically, you specify like the, some parameters so that you, you use the similar ideas as like here, like here, okay, like here. So, so th th there are many modifications to, to this idea. Uh, for this uh, straight line guidance rule. There are many uh, ideas, so I cannot cover in details right now. Um, but people simply adding other constraints, saying that my turning radius cannot be very sharp, because if I turn very f sharp, then I will have lots of aerodynamic pressure or force or moments on my body, so may break my wing, right? Give my structure damage. So then there's some constraints to add. So also, uh, there are many other ways to add different waypoints, okay? Different waypoints. So in, in, in conclusion, in conclusion, this kind of hierarchy is easy to understand, okay? We do not zoom in the flight dynamics in different parts, okay? Okay, so we can, I explained this one multiple times, but this small module, we try to understand in a way from GNC point of view, okay? Or NCG, NCG. Again, guidance section has more than one solutions depending on what do you want and what is your required performance as well as what is your constraints, like how fast you can turn. You don't get broken, okay? So it's called uh, structure strength constraints. Okay? Because it's so fragile, you turn fast, you break the wing, right? or something like that. So, well, um, this module is here, and I'm going to finish this. And uh, what 
do you have here? So let me go through here. Today we covered command and control and GNC briefly. And uh, the hierarchical structure architecture for the, for the drone control okay, can be better appreciated from the guidance navigation control the structure, okay? Structure. And Wednesday, I'm going to do more payloads because without payloads, why you fly, okay? Supposedly, your guidance, command, control, all these things, there isn't anything you can really tweak. It's already there for a given drone. But for you, it's good to understand it in case there are some places you need to change. But I hope everyone still should focus on the end use of the drone, and not maintenance of the drone, okay? Not creation of the drone. Not design a new ground from ground up. It's not, like, not our emphasis. So therefore, we probably should pay some attention on payloads because every new payload will open lots of doors for your uh, business opportunities. Uh, like what we do for the methane sniffing, we're very unique because the sensor is unique. Okay? And I hope we have a, a more higher level of a view of all what we do so that you are ready to uh, appreciate. So this is a one hour presentation. So then we have uh, precision ag, uh, all agricultural parts uh, from uh, two visiting uh, uh, speakers um, ne next Wednesday. Okay. And at 11.30 we are having um, Kara from our venture lab to give you an uh, overview of the, what we have in there. And uh, so next Monday, we are going to do a lot of uh, small aspects uh, about remote sensing because that usually you use drones to do something meaningful. Majority of them are not made up. Uh, and drone services, I'll share with you different types of possible services. And I'm going to talk about public ac acceptance, privacy issues, and export control, ITAR issues. Start from that. Then next Friday will be final exam for three hours here. And today, I ask the board to send you the final project requirements so you can start to do, basically you have two weeks. Okay, you have two weeks. I want everything finished by June 30th, okay? Every, everything finished by June 30th. Data line cannot be crossed June 30th. Remember that, okay? For, an inter, uh, for entrepreneurship, uh, I hope you check um, our week five slides. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, 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 syllabus. Uh, it's uh, lecture notes, week five. So you see there is something called startup guide. Startup guide in here. Can you see my mouse? So click that and take a look. Quick look. May point you something very interesting. And the principle of guidance navigation is already uploaded in here. And uh, the flyers for Wednesday's two invited talks are already uploaded in here. And there's one thing I, I will upload that is last. Last, uh, last year, fourth semester, I invited uh, Professor McBride to give an uh, invited uh, lecture for my class. 75 minutes, he talked about what if I want to become an entrepreneur, neuro. And uh, he's a new professor um, 
He's a new professor we just hired for the management department. And uh, his expertise is in innovation and entrepreneurial. Okay? So um, this deck of slides is very interesting. And um, so he didn't uh, script uh, his uh, talk, um, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that he spent a long time on this one. Uh, <laughs> so all these things are wrong. Uh, uh, so all these things are wrong, and uh, uh, like entrepreneur has to be like Superman myth. Uh, so basically, he said, I think it's interesting that entrepreneurship is actually a, a team sport or like social activity. So that's why in the final project, I hope you have this kind of feeling. Okay? You never know in the, in the future, this initial seeding <laughs> will produce something significant. So, uh, so I'm going to upload this. Oh, what's this? Interesting. Do you see this? No? I cannot do uh, So it's pretty inspiring, uh, pretty interesting, and uh, so I'm not going to go through. And he shared his uh, drone startup story uh, as well. Um, so I, I think he can be your resource if you have questions regarding entrepreneurship. And, uh, so again, he's a professor, okay? He has very deep knowledge, deep connections. Uh, but Kara, who is going to give you an introduction and give you a tour after that, Tour is next door. It's our venture lab at the water. Uh, she will give you uh, from ecosystem point of view what's on on our campus. Okay. So with that, I'm going to get you a 10 minutes break, and let's wait her uh, arrival. And we start at 11:30. Uh, okay.
the USMR side NSF I Corps program. Uh, now I'm in the Ops of Business Development, which is actually the hub for a lot of other other programs. So we are all about innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, and we offer a lot of really different uh, resources to help not just support people part of the university system, but actually the broader community. So here is a really great graphic of just our simple programs. So the Office of Business Development here in the middle, uh, and I'm gonna go over each of these in depth, but the Office of Business Development here in the middle uh, is actually the office that manages the intellectual property for the university. Are any of you guys familiar with Tech Transfer? Tech Transfer? Anybody else show of hands, Tech Transfer? Okay, so the Office of Tech Transfer is an office that exists at most universities, but it doesn't exist at ours anymore. So the Office of Tech Transfer is the office that manages intellectual property, that files patents, that does all this stuff. And so we actually had this office, uh, but that business model was a very outdated model. So we've replaced it with the Office of Business Development. Uh, so when you are a grad stu graduate student or you're a staff member or you're an employee at the university, if you create something, come to us, we can help you turn it into something. So going over the biz Office of Business Development in more depth, uh, so managing the intellectual property portfolio, this means that everything that our faculty and everyone at our university, anything that you create goes into our portfolio. And we have a team of market researchers that help you really assess what's the commercial opportunity for that. Uh, you know, because it's more than just filing a patent. If you're going to file a patent, it's because you want to defend yourself in a commercial landscape. You don't just file a patent on something that sits on a shelf. So we have a team of market researchers that will work with you to help you assess what's that commercial opportunity. Uh, now we also manage the industry alliances portion of UC Merced. That means that we manage the relationship between companies. Uh, that want to have a relationship with us. So sometimes we'll get companies who come to UC Merced and they want to hire you guys um, or they want to do some research on their product and their company. And so all of that our office also manages. Um, and then business development services, this is also the market research process. Um, I'm going to be talking a lot about market research because that's uh, my favorite topic. Uh, if, you, if you're going to do something, you want to make sure that people in the market actually care about it. And that's the whole thing. So this is our staff. Uh, the director of our program and the associate vice chancellor for research and economic development is Dr. Peter Sherman. Uh, he's also the director of the Venture Lab. Uh, and uh, his assistant is uh, Stephanie Butici. Uh, she's also Sam Traina's assistant, if you know Sam Traina. He's the vice chancellor of research here at UC Merced. Uh, and then Rosalina Ronda, who's our operations manager. Uh, she makes sure that everything uh, stays running. So these are some simple pictures of the uh, Venture Lab Merced. And I think it's really important to point out that there's only one person on here who has a prototype. This is Michael Lerner and Paul Barguth. Uh, these two developed something while they were students and part of Capstone. And so what they developed is something that can actually save the lives of premature infants. They developed this in a partnership with uh, Valley Children's Hospital. And it's a tool, it's a, it's a way of pumping air into the incubators that premature infants are placed in uh, it gives them this air so that they don't get bacterial infections. Because right now, the current systems in these hospitals, they, they get these bacterial infections, the hospitals, the nurses know it, they expect it, uh, and they can only treat it afterwards. And so with Michael and Paul's invention, uh, they're able to actually prevent these uh, infants from getting sick. So as I said, there's only one picture here with this, this because what we really do, more than anything, more than just the invention, more than just the physical thing, we help you build a company. And that's kind of invisible. It looks a lot like partnerships and relationships and conversations with people. So here is a meeting with Janet Napolitano and some of our entrepreneurs. And Augustine and Michael again up here. So Augustine and Michael are two different entrepreneurs, two different companies, um, but they came in first and second place in the San Joaquin uh, Entrepreneurship Challenge. So funded by the San Joaquin Angel Group which is a big group of investors. And these guys got first and second place out of the entire valley, 16 counties. And our team made it. So we're pretty excited about them. And I think that the reason that they're at the top is because they collaborate with each other. There's this big misconception that when you're an entrepreneur, you're the one guy that figured it out, the one girl who figured it out. You have a great idea, you're successful. But that's never the case. It's all about collaboration and working together with people. And so that's what we help people do. 
We help you break into that, working with other people and knowing how to collaborate and share ideas. And so these two, although they're, they were competitors in this competition, they came in first and second place, and I think it's because they helped each other. So they beat out all these other guys because they learned how to talk to each other. And that's really, really important. Uh, and then up here we have an event called Speed Mentoring. This is actually one of my favorite events. You see Joseph's back here. <laughs> Um, so this is an event where uh, our startups on the right and then mentors on the left will have all sorts of different types of mentors with different backgrounds. will come in and they will share their expertise and they do it in a speed mentoring fashion. So you get 15 minutes, do we like each other, do we click, do we not? Okay, move on to the next person. It helps people figure out who are all the mentors in the program, who are all the members in the program and get really custom tailored advice. In 15 minutes, and then after that, if you really like each other, you can schedule more time. So that's one of the, the events that the Venture Lab offers. Does anyone have any questions on Venture Lab? So Venture Lab Modesto. We're pretty excited about this. Uh, we're launching another incubator up in Modesto. Uh, we got some funding through the state that's allowing us to expand our program. So this is going to be very similar to Venture Lab Merced. We offer locations to meet. Uh, we offer uh, connections to people in the community, access to lawyers, access to business consultants. The difference is, is that Modesto is not Merced. So the ecosystem there is going to be different. And we want to be careful to make sure that we cater our programs for each area just the same way that we did for Merced. So for Merced, Merced's incubator is really not what people would think of when they think of a traditional incubator. Because we're not in Silicon Valley and we're not in the Bay Area. So what we offer is custom tailored to what people in Merced need. They need this early stage advice. They need access to people with the team. If you've even just got like an idea or even pre-idea, we'll help you build that team and develop that idea into something. Modesto is going to be very similar. Uh, we're still building this out, so the exact shape of Modesto is going to be figured out as we go. Uh, so this hopefully is coming online before the end of the year. We're thinking about mid-fall. You guys all know this building. This is Venture Lab Atwater. It's two doors down. This is our micro manufacturing facility. So we're really excited about Venture Lab Atwater because we're seeing it as a second stage, a second step to Venture Lab Merced. Right? So you come into Merced, you have an idea or pre-idea, or you have an invention, you have something, but it's really early stage. We will do the business development side with you, and then you come over to Atwater and we do the technical development. There's a big misconception that the longer I work on my app, or the, the more prototypes I make, uh, then I'm farther along in my company. But business development and technical development are very different. So sometimes people don't know how to do one or the other. And so that's why the programs are separated such so that you can get the exp uh, expertise in both programs. So we're expecting people who graduate from Venture Lab Merced or Venture Lab Modesto to go then into Atwater. Um, but there are going to be some cases where people can just go straight into Atwater who, you know, you've already got your business kind of figured out and now you just need a place to make. So I get people who ask me this question of what's the difference between this and a makerspace? So it's actually very different from a makerspace. A makerspace is more of like a, a place to come and have fun and tinker. This has vision. So you have to have a vision for your company and everything you do is with intention. You're not just you're not just like prototyping and fidgeting, and you're actually creating something because you have a customer that wants it, and you're going to eventually, long-term goal, manufacture it and get it out there. So this has an application process that's a little bit more intense to get into uh, than Merced or Modesto. It's not impossible, but we're saying that most people who are going to get into this are people who've come through Merced first. Okay, so this brings me to our product development center. Um, Product Development Center is really cool. Uh, so this is something that's coming online in Madeira. It's a later stage of what Venture Lab Atwater would be. So the Product Development Center is a physical location where companies would come and they would use it as like an external R&D location. So they would actually build large scale, uh, you know, ready to sell, sell uh, manufacturing. And so you get your manufacturing channels, you get your, your, your thing built. Um, and this is the only one that you would actually pay for. Uh, all the other programs, everything is free. Um, so we don't touch intellectual property rights, we don't touch equity, uh, everything is free. 
uh, accept product development center because these are going to usually be later stage companies that already have a customer that are kind of ready to go to market. Uh, and so we're going to see larger companies like our affiliate companies coming in here and using it to, to make something. Proof of concept fund. Uh, so we've also set aside about $300,000 uh, to invest in startups. Uh, so as the name implies, it's a really early stage investment. You can think of this almost like a pre-pre-seed investment, uh, which is really early stage. Uh, so, so teams who are in the Venture Lab and its affiliated programs in the Office of Business Development are eligible for this, uh, but outside people can also apply for it. Uh, if you get our assistance with it, it might go better. Um, but what we're looking for here is that you're going to build something, but it's not just to build it. It's because, again, you have a purpose. You have a customer. You have a place you want it to go. And if you've got a direction, you've got somewhere you want to be, and you just need a little bit of financing to get there, this is the program for you. So you can apply for this. Any questions on the program so far? So for the proof of concept fund, what, what's needed to apply? Uh, well, you have to either go through the Venture Lab or its associated programs, or you need to meet with us. And what we're really looking at is we want to see that you've defined your business model. Uh, and when I first heard the word business model and business plan, I heard it was like a 50-page document, but it doesn't have to be. It can actually be one page, and it can be really easy. You can look up the business model canvas online. I totally recommend it. Um, that is a tool that you can use to write your business plan all in one document. If you can show one of those documents to this committee and be convincing, I think you'd, get a, you'd have a pretty good shot. So it's the business model canvas. Any other questions about this before I go on? It's primarily for inventors, though, right? No, it's, um, what do you mean? And inventors as in uh, new products or new applications to products or primarily engineering applications. So this isn't for something like tried and true practices, like importing and exporting. Or right, yeah. Right, yes. So that's proof of concept within that name is I'm not really sure if, I, if it's possible. I think it is. I want to test it out and I want a little bit of money to try it. Um, so usually with tried and true business models, you, you kind of either know it's going to work or you don't. Um, or you can look at somebody else that's doing what you want to do and you can kind of mimic them. Uh, but in startups and in new types of ventures, there's so much uncertainty. And so this entire process really is just a grand experiment and you have no idea what the variables are. So you're just exploring, and it's a lot of un unveiling that uncertainty. So the, uh, the goal is to use a proof of concept fund as a tool to reduce that uncertainty. So it's not just for inventors, but it's people who want to do something different. Uh, we have people who are doing startups that don't have products, their services. Um, I mean, think of Uber. They, you could mimic their app, but that's not the thing that made them unique. The network is what made them unique. And that in itself is the business. So, I mean, you want to think about it. It's, it's something that's just a different way of doing something. You can put all of these familiar old pieces together in a new way. That's a new thing. And so that's not necessarily engineering. That's not necessarily building a thing. Um, but if your proof of concept was, I think if I could get to Seattle and I could get this app into everyone's hands, which is Uber, right, um, then I think that they would want it. I just need $5,000 to get up to Uber, uh, to get up to Seattle and to get it started. That counts as proof of concept because you just need something to prove that it will work. Any other questions? All right, so this one's personally my favorite. Um, so, yes, these are the handouts that you have. Um, are any of you guys familiar with the National Science Foundation I Corps program? <laughs> okay, great. Um, then I get to tell you all about it. Um, so, NSF I Corps is a program. Uh, Actually, fun fact, Tom Peterson, our provost, is the person who co-founded it at NSF. Um, so it's actually a really, really great program. Uh, and the purpose of this program originally was to help uh, our professors who got uh, maybe some NSF-funded research, uh, help them commercialize it. But in recent years, NSF realized they could do so much more if they didn't just stick to NSF-funded research. Uh, so what they did is they opened it up, and they created these programs called SITES. Sites and nodes. So this is a map of all of the sites and nodes across the United States. There's about 70 sites. Oop. 
there's us right here. We actually belong to the Bay Area node. Uh, and the purpose of this, really, is to connect all of these universities, all of these people together, all of these nodes, to help them talk to the market. Because it's not just about building a thing. Because if you build a thing and you spend your life savings building it, and all of your money and all of your time and your patience and your friend's patience, and at the end of the day, nobody buys it, even though you think they will, nobody will buy it, then it's a huge waste of time. So the purpose of this program is to get you out the door, is to get you talking to people, to help validate your ideas, not with the people inside the building, but outside the building. Right, so I mean, building a company is like a lot like building, building a thing, building a widget, right? The difference is you can tell the parts what to do when it's a mechanical thing. But in the market, all these pieces are completely uncertain. They're people. They make their own decisions. They all have their own free will. So how do you build something with all of these really uncertain pieces? This program is designed to help you really learn how to talk to these people, to pull really interesting and helpful metrics out of those conversations, and then apply it. So we're really excited because we're the newest site in this map. Uh, and we're launching our first cohort uh, this August. And so all that information is on your flyers. What that means is you'll have an opportunity to become a part of the National Innovation Network. If you come through our site and you're successful, you can get anywhere between $1,000 and $3,000 to travel to do your market research. So say you need to go talk to all these hospitals and universities uh, in Texas. You can apply for like $2,000, get a plane ticket, and use that to go talk to people in Texas. Um, the program is really designed to get you out the door and talking to people. If you make it past our site, then you get to go on to Berkeley, where the Bay Area node is. They've got a short program, uh, and if you get past their program, then you go into the national program, which has got about $50,000 at stake and the opportunity to apply for more grants. Um, so really, if you're interested in commercializing research or something that you've developed here, this is a really great program because they help you every step of the way and they give you money to do it, which is really great. Any questions on this? Okay, so the Central Valley Entrepreneurship Academy. We have a partnership with UC Davis, uh, Mike and Renee Child Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. They have a really long name. Um, their academy is really cool because what they do is they'll focus on a certain aspect of entrepreneurship. So they'll do food science, uh, they'll do mechanical, they'll do all sorts of different things. A lot of it's, a lot of it's ag based, um, but it's really good uh, because what it is is about three days of lecture where they will also do the same thing that i -Corps does, but even more condensed than i -Corps, and i -Corps is pretty condensed. Um, so the target I think here is more for grad students and faculty, but it's really cool if you're interested in like networking with the national labs like Lawrence Livermore and Sandia National Labs. So we're going to be offering this in November. You're going to see more information coming up soon. Central Valley Ventures. So we have a partnership with UC Berkeley Law. This is Kevin Shu and Bill Kell. Uh, between the two of them, they run uh, the UC Berkeley Law New Business Practicum. Uh, this is a partnership that we started back in October, October 2015. Provides free legal assistance, not just to the teams in the Venture Lab and its associated programs, but actually to the entire Central Valley. So we're really excited to be launching this. Uh, we're kicking this off this year. Uh, we've already started a pilot test here, Modesto, and then soon in Atwater. Um, and so it's slowly starting to go out to the rest of the network. Um, but the, the really great thing about these guys is they can help you with contracts. There's so much more liability in starting a company than you realize. And there's a lot of, lot of legal pitfalls you want to avoid. And these guys are fantastic. So they can help you figure out what all those things are. So you don't have to be a business person. You don't have to be a lawyer. We'll give you all the people that you need. Um, and also, so by partnering with all of the lawyers here in the Valley, uh, lawyers have pro bono hours that they have to use. Uh, and so if they can plug into Central Valley Ventures, now we can leverage all of the local lawyers without competing with them and provide free legal assistance to everyone in, t in the entire Central Valley. All right, any questions? Nothing? <laughs> so uh, how many uh, existing uh, undergraduate students are uh, in your program right now? 
I believe the number is about 25 undergraduate students. Uh, we've got a good handful of graduate students, faculty, and staff, uh, but a majority of our partners are actually uh, from the broader community. Um, so we're a very flexible program. Uh, we'll help you get a patent, but we'll also help you with uh, getting connected to local real estate. It just kind of depends on what you're looking for. Um, we've got a really cool affiliate program where we uh, have actually attracted some companies from Silicon Valley to Merced. My favorite story is of uh, Jim Drury and life-saving images. So I don't know if you guys have seen this yet, but there's this huge pink bus that drives around Merced. They park in front of Ross and they park in front of uh, Walmart, and uh, what they do is they do uh, mobile mammogram screenings. So they realize that uh, Merced actually has some of the highest breast cancer rates in California, like really high up there. And they wanted to do something about it. And they thought, well, why are people not getting checked? And it's because we don't have access to doctors. So they, put, they loaded up all of the medical equipment they need on a bus. And they started driving around Merced. And they started parking in front of Walmart and all these other stores. And it's really funny because when they first went up to Walmart, they went and talked to the manager. And they said, can we park your bus out front? We'd love to just help your customers as they're shopping. We can come out to get some medical tests done and then go back. And you know the manager's like, all right, I guess, if you want to. Huh. And so he's outside. They're parked in front. And that day, Walmart actually saw a huge spike in sales. Uh -huh. And Hobby Lobby sees that they have them next door. And Hobby Lobby's like, can, can we get one of those? So it, their, their demand is going up. And so they're going to have about three more by the end of the year. And so we're seeing them really expand. So when they came to Merced, they didn't need so much the business advice. What they needed was a physical place to come, sit down and have a computer and have a printer, um, and introductions. So we could introduce them to all sorts of people in the community, all sorts of medical leaders and health leaders, um, and help them really get seated into the community. Um, so that's, that's what we help people do. We help plug you in based on what you're looking for. And you don't have to really be late stage. I mean, if you have an idea or even pre-idea, pre-idea is probably better, and we can help you figure it out from there. Excellent. So uh, please come on another question and let you go. Sorry, I, I do have another question. Uh, just, just more out of curiosity. So, at, at the uh, at Auto Lab here, uh, what what type of manufacturing capabilities does it have? So, we're looking at the different types of equipment right now. Um, we've got two members of Venture Lab Merced who've given us an equipment list. I'm um, working with the advisory board for Atwater right now to figure out what's feasible. Um, but it looks like we've got some circuit board. Uh, I, forgive me, I don't know the, the term for this, but it's like a circuit board designer. Um, some larger 3D printers. We have a couple of 3D printers in Venture Lab Merced, but I think we want to get something that's a little more, a little bigger. Um, it's just some other space. Yeah, so my guess, that's, the answer to that is it's really flexible right now. So we're kind of open for suggestions. You can get some metal printers, that'd be pretty sweet. Yeah, we were looking at those metal printers. Um, they're like $700,000, yeah, and you can print cars. They're pretty cool. Yeah. But I don't, I think that ended up being on the table. Yeah, those are pretty expensive. So I think we have a Venture Lab uh, newsletter. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, also we have a Twitter account for you to follow, I remember. <laughs> yeah, so I think, I think we're pretty active on Facebook, yeah, if you find Venture Lab Facebook. Yeah. Um, we also have a newsletter we come out with, with new things. Um, we're going to be announcing i very soon. Um, you guys are kind of getting the exclusive scoop right now. Um, so, yeah. So if I visualize what uh, we have right now, it's like a wave of resources to help you to make your um, dream true. So right away, right away, at this point, it's early stage. I see it's a ramping stage. Yep. So it's from my point of view, it's best timing best time to leverage all the resources. So all you need to do is come out with innovative ideas. And so hopefully this course will become a, this strong class will be kind of a substrate to support your, uh, stir you up. Well, 
So what we are going to do next is to make a tour to the future incubator for your company. Okay, as your final project. Hopefully we have one or two selected by uh, Venture Lab committees. The selection so, process, by the way, I didn't go over this, but if you're interested in joining any of the programs, uh, contact us. It's an interview. Yeah. We just we interview you. It's really casual. Come and tell us what you're doing, and, and we'll help you figure it out. So, can you please join me to thank Kara for the time? Thank you, Kara. Thank you. All right. Can you turn that off? Uh, yes.